All right, I want to start by saying good morning to everyone who is joining me on this Friday morning um, and also thank you to NSU for putting together this awesome webinar series. I'm thrilled to be a part of it. So today I'm going to be speaking about ways to develop an effective coping kit during this really anxiety provoking time of COVID-19 and the key word here is effective. So just to orient you to the things that I'm going to cover in today's webinar, I will give you a little bit of my background. I'll talk to you about the importance of today's topic. You're already here and attending, so you must think it's important in some way, but I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the rationale behind the topic and how you can apply it to decrease your anxiety during this time. Um, a lot of people are really struggling in this area, so I want to give you some easy, concrete steps that you can take to increase the number of helpful tools that you have in your coping kit right now. And one of the biggest areas to really overcome is how to not get stuck on the things that you don't have right now. And then we'll talk about some do's and don'ts of each step. I'll give you some examples, really get you thinking about ways to modify and adapt in this area. And my objective for today is if you take away one thing from this webinar, one thing that you can do to cope uh, more effectively, then, then that's a win in my book. Finally, I'll open it up for some questions and answers. So just a little bit of background on myself. I am a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Florida. I am an assistant professor at Nova Southeastern University, which is located in Fort Lauderdale or Davie, Florida. I also serve as director of the NSU Anxiety Treatment Center, where I train students on how to see patients and help them with some of the things that I really specialize in, which is helping people overcome complicated psychiatric and mental health histories. We really focus on anxiety and distress and also helping people get unstuck. A lot of these problems are very overwhelming and consuming. And so you need people like myself and my trainees to help you get unstuck and get moving in the things that are most important to you so you can get that quality of life back up. So as I said, my objective for today is if you even take one thing away um, from this webinar, then, then it's a win. And I'm hoping that some of the examples that I provide for you today will help you get unstuck in some of these areas. So why is today's topic important? Um, you might already have coping tools that you typically relied on prior to this pandemic. However, these are not normal times. You may well have found out that your normal coping tools, your normal go-tos are not available right now. Then we couple that with added stress, worries, fears, uncertainty, and that actually leads to an increased difficulty with decision-making, concentrating, focus, and really disrupting the other maybe typically very stable areas of your life, your schedule, your routine, sleep, exercise, even your meals, all of these areas might get really disrupted. And what we tend to see with anxiety is anxiety keeps us at a pretty high go, 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 fast paced level. And when we're in that stage of I'm anxious, I'm, I'm anxious, this is so stressful, it makes it really hard to identify what are some good coping skills, what can I do right now, and then actually following through with using them. So all of those things together, if we combine not having your normal coping skills available, we add that stress, worry, fear, and uncertainty into the mix, we have greater distress, greater difficulty identifying and then using those good coping skills. So my goal today is to help you get there. So why is it more difficult? As I said, stressful times um, may actually lead to greater difficulty in this area. Why? What's happening in our bodies? This actually may lead to activation of what we call the sympathetic nervous system. This is your fight, flight, or freeze response. That is why we see people going out and hoarding things like toilet paper, right? They feel this anxiety and they have to do something with observing 
Uh oh, I'm getting a thing here that says I am muted. Okay. Can everyone still hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, so as I said, we're seeing this, you know, in the news and everything that, that um, people are really anxious right now. And what happens in your body is then it stays in this state of preparedness. This, it is go time. This is not the time to relax. I have to be ready. So today's strategies are really designed to help you slow down, identify healthy coping skills, ways you can use them, even with the restrictions of um, certain activities or locations. And then what we want to do is really activate that parasympathetic nervous system. This is the rest and digest function, and that's what we really want to tap into. So some of you in the audience may be saying, Dr. Thayer, no way. I have a lot on my plate right now. Now is not the time to relax. I want you to keep this principle in mind that even prized fighters have to step out of the ring. And when they do, they are taking that time to rest and recover. So I get it. Yes, there absolutely might be a lot on your plate right now. However, take the time and um, rest and recover so that you can be more effective in all domains of your life. So I want to give you an easy way to think about your coping skills. As I said, a lot of people are, are feeling really anxious right now and, and having a hard time identifying things that they can do. So I want to give you an easy way to think about that. So some of the things you may have relied on, going to the gym, spending time with friends, these aren't available right now. The worst thing you can do is get stuck here. So we want to really adapt and shift our thinking. So we're, we're taking inventory, we're thinking about it. Okay, my normal coping skills are not available. I'm missing some, some tools from my toolkit. How can I increase the number of tools in my coping kit? I want you to think about your five senses, right? We learn about our five senses when we're little and then we kind of don't think about them anymore, right? So hearing, touch, vision, smell, and taste. So I'm gonna go through each of these areas, but first I want you to really, again, take this moment to check in with yourself. Do a little self-reflection, a little bit of inventory taking, and really ask yourself, okay, my, my coping during this pandemic, have I been relying on one thing too heavily or maybe excessively? Are there areas that I haven't explored or considered even putting in my coping kit? Um, are there ones I think I already know these are not gonna work? Am I trying to avoid or numb out stress? Am I doing things like oversleeping? Am I avoiding tasks that I need to be doing for school or work? And I'm experiencing ne negative consequences because I'm not doing them, but what's really driving that is my avoidance. These answers might really help guide you in determining if it's like, oh, wow, I really need to up the coping skills that I have. So let's dive in. Let's start talking about the first one. And this is a big one. Touch is one that um, a lot of people are missing right now. Um, and so we you know, commonly hear people say things like, well, I can't see my friends or my long distance partner. I can't get together with my family members right now. Why is this so important? As a human being, physical touch and feeling connected to other people is really important for our well-being. And unfortunately, a lot of us are feeling really socially isolated during this pandemic and missing out on those things that we're used to. So as we're talking about each of these five senses, I've really gone through and identified what's that underlying principle so that you can figure out other ways to tap into it. And then, as I said, I give you examples, not an exhaustive list, but just things to start the ball rolling and get you thinking about how you can address this area. So for touch, hugs and physical contact make us feel loved and close to others. Physical touch also releases a feel-good hormone in our bodies called oxytocin, and oxytocin has been linked to social bonding. So the worst thing you can do right now is just stay isolated in your room and really dwell on the fact that you can't see so-and-so or you haven't been able to um, spend time with this other person. But this is really, really key. Social distancing 
does not have to equal isolation right now. Let me say that again. Social distancing does not have to equal isolation right now. So there are a lot of other things you can do to still feel connected and loved. Um, you can reach out to see others and connect in other ways. We are very fortunate to have things like FaceTime and Zoom. And um, some studies have shown that that kind of lights up the same areas of the brain that when we're with spending time with people, you can still tap into those same things through technology. Um, you can also snuggle with pets. Research has shown that people and their pets both release oxytocin when they're in contact with each other. Um, so, and we're seeing that, right? Um, a lot of people are um, fostering or adopting animals right now, and uh, there might be something to that, right? There are also things that you can do on your own to comfort or self-soothe. So having soft items around like um uh, like soft fuzzy blankets weighted blankets are really popular right now a favorite sweater there are also other self-soothing activities that you may want to look into and explore things like face masks using um, lotions taking hot showers or baths so again not an exhaustive list but just some ideas to get you thinking about um, if this area has been one that you've been maybe neglected um, or um, gotten stuck on. All right, so hearing. This is another one that people kind of discount or maybe don't really think about. But what am I hearing? I'm hearing this from a lot of people right now. All anyone is talking about is the pandemic and it's really stressing me out. And we often forget we're really sensitive to the sounds and information that we hear in our environment. And if you're somebody who's like, nah, not super important, if this isn't really affecting me, think back. Think back to when you were a child. How did your parents comfort you? Did they sing you lullabies? Did you have a favorite song or sound? And that's something that helped calm you down? That really tells us how important sound is. And the, the underlying principle there is sounds can do a lot for us, right? They can comfort us, they can soothe us, but they can also uplift our mood or really energize us. So one of the worst things you can do is have the news on in the background all day. Uh, even if you're doing other things, you're cooking, you're cleaning, you're working, having that on in the background is going to lead to an increased level of stress right? It's, it's there. You're constantly getting that input. Um, while we may love certain songs, they might be really attached to sad and lonely feelings. Now is probably not the best time to really call those things up. Instead, we want to really look for things that lift our mood, make us feel happy and energized, um, alternatively relaxed, right? So we want to look for things like free live concerts from your favorite bands or musicians, right? A lot of um, our favorite artists are putting out music and things that we can still connect with them over technology. You may also want to think about what you find relaxing, either music or sounds, whether that be, you know, listening to a recording of a thunderstorm, waves at the beach, classical music. Um, now's really the time to reconnect with those things. Also listening to music that makes you feel happy or energized. Now is also a great time to explore podcasts. If you've never checked them out, there are a ton, right? With a bunch of different types of topics. So look for ones, look for ones that inspire you, make you laugh, help you learn new things. Um, I listened to a podcast all about polar bears. Fascinating, right? Like there's, there's just the sky's the limit in the things that you can find and learn. Um, so now's a, now's a great time to do that. You can also check out different apps, um, like things that help um, you with guided meditations, learning a new language. Again, now's a great time to explore some of those things that maybe you hadn't considered. All right, sight. So here's another biggie. A lot of people are starting to say, oh my goodness, I feel like I'm in Groundhog's Day, right? I'm getting cabin fever from being in my house. 
Um, and this makes sense. We are used to experiencing a variety of settings throughout our days. We may go from school to our part-time job to the gym. We may, may then spend time with friends at the movies, going out to different restaurants, going to um, other people's homes. So we're very much used to a variety of environments and settings, and that's really important. That helps keep our minds interested and active. So it makes sense that people are getting stuck here when they're feeling very stuck in their houses and seeing the same things over and over without that um, mix, if you will. So what do we do? So um, I'm not saying don't watch the news ever, but I would say limit your exposure. So having the news on all day and just watching those COVID-19 case numbers tick up is not helpful for you. Um, my second point here is don't watch pandemic outbreak or the influenza documentaries. Why do I have this on here? Because as I'm scrolling through the TV guide, I'm seeing them on a lot. This is one of the worst things you can do. Um, so I would recommend steering away from, from these for now. Um, a lot of people are working from home and you may need to be spending quite a few hours on your computer or on your phone. I get that. And I'm saying take breaks, take breaks away, let your eyes rest, let your brain rest, take those breaks. So what else can you do? How can you switch it up and keep your mind interested and, and getting that variety that, that you're used to? So I'd recommend watching funny or uplifting movies. And also changing up your surroundings as best as you can. Go outside, take walks. Um, something that I have been doing is trying to take a new route or a different street every single time I take my dog for a walk. Um, also mindful observing. You can do this from your window. So really seeing if you can notice um, any things from your environment that you hadn't noticed before. Um, this is something that I teach my students how to do. And um, it's usually a really interesting experiment. They usually find things that they're like, wow, I didn't realize that tree was recently cut down or I didn't notice that my neighbor got a new whatever, right? So there's, um, there's, there's things that you may not be aware of and it's another way to really engage your sense of sight. The next one I love, exploring your backyard. This is a great one to do um, for families, especially if you have younger kiddos, having it be an adventure, right? Um, maybe you decide to take your kiddos outside and see how many different bugs you can find. Uh, I'm located in South Florida. There's probably a good chance I'll be able to find a few. Um, so thinking about things like that, ways to um, really explore and, and find new things, right? Maybe then looking for the neighbor's kitty cat in the bushes, um, seeing how many birds you can count, things like that. Um, now is also a great time to do things like puzzles or painting, right? That's gonna be visually stimulating and might not be something that you typically spend time doing. Now's a great time to do that. A lot of people are actually starting gardens and this is also something that can really engage your sense of sight. You can watch it grow each day. Not only are you spending time nurturing something, but you get to get excited and look forward to seeing those little sprouts come up, figuring out ways to really um, help your garden flourish. And there's also, you know, um, uh, a lot of museums and zoos are doing virtual visits. So that's another way to kind of travel right now, if you will, even though we are at home. Finally, one of my favorite ones is um, library books. I, they're free and it's like, a, you know, choosing your own adventure. You can choose where you go. You can go to a foreign land or a magical setting. And that is not only engaging for your sense of sight, but also your brain, right? Your, your um, mental visualization. Okay, so hopefully people are getting good, good ideas here. Um, the other one that's really important, they're all important, but um, taste. 
So a lot of people are getting stuck here, right? We can't go out to eat anymore. My favorite restaurant is closed. Why is this one important? We often have really strong memories tied to food. And if you think back, you may have these memories, your mom's chicken noodle soup when you were sick, um, having traditional family recipes that have been passed down for generations that maybe you know, an uh, elderly family member taught you how to make this and it was a really special time. Even just fun, fun times that you spent with friends. So the key principle here to remember is food is a powerful thing and it helps us feel comforted during tough times, but also connected to others. So um, I recommend steering clear from drinking alcohol excessively right now, um, engaging in drug use, or relying too heavily on comfort food or fast food. So I'm not saying, oh, you have to eat only healthy things right now. I say balance it as best as you can. So absolutely, now is the time to have some comfort foods around or fun items, but we're really trying to balance that with also healthy, nutritious meals. Now is a great time to try new recipes. Um, the, the things in your cookbooks that you haven't tried yet or didn't have the time, now's the time to do it. And again, for families and, and folks with kiddos, get them involved, get them measuring things or you know, helping you in the kitchen. This is a great family activity. A lot of people like to have comforting or soothing items on hand, like teas or having hard candies, um, or even just like a special type of chocolate, that, that's how they end their day. So there's um, you know, certainly some options there as well. Um, now's a great time to support your local restaurants by ordering in and exploring new restaurants you haven't been to. Um, during this pandemic, I actually discovered there is a super cool Jamaican restaurant near me and they have awesome jerk chicken. I didn't know that and I probably wouldn't have um, sought that out had it not been for this pandemic. You can also make plans with others, things to look forward to. We're hearing a lot from people that the days are starting to blur together. Um, I, don't, I don't even know what day it is, right? But when you have plans that you can look forward to, things like Taco Tuesday or Friday nights or for pizza, um, those give you that sense of structure. You can turn these into, you know, Zoom dinner parties. A lot of people are, are doing that right now. Um, but again, this is a great place to involve multiple family members. Maybe you, you tell um, one of your children like, okay, Wednesdays are your day. Uh, and you get to decide what we're eating on Wednesdays. And again, something fun to look forward to. All right, smell. We have arrived to the, to the last one here, smell. Uh, people might be like, nah, this one's not that important. Like, nah, we could skip this one, but don't skip this one. So think back. Um, just like certain songs or foods really um, are tied to strong memories, scents can be also, we won't get into the details, but maybe a certain perfume or cologne really makes you think about somebody. Again, not going to go into details, but you know what I'm talking about, right? So scents can really elicit feelings of nostalgia, but also comfort. And so that underlying principle is smells are important because they can help comfort, uh, soothe or relax us. So don't ignore this one. Um, I want you to seek out comforting scents. So people might be looking into things like essential oils, candles, scented lotions. Again, we just talked about taste and how um, powerful that is. Maybe it's that smell of those baked goods or those family recipes. And I say do a BOGO, right? Buy one, get one with your coping skills. If you can get creative and combine some of these coping skills um, to really hit on multiple of the five senses, you're gonna be better off. So um, just two examples, right, of using a scented lotion after a bath, you're combining scent and touch. And just as I said, baking, you're really combining that smell and taste. So get creative. Think about ways that you can really engage all of your five senses and um, see how that goes. 
Okay. So I gave you a lot of examples, but I also really focused on those underlying principles. If the examples are like, well, oh, that doesn't really work for me, or I'm not really interested in that, still think about how you can tap into that. So your objective for today is really to notice if you're getting stuck on the things that you don't have right now or the things that you can't do. So see if you can shift your thinking, tap into some of those principles in other ways. Is there another way that you can get this need met? And if you can identify one thing, just one thing, right? If you're someone who's like, geez, I really, I really need to kind of overhaul my coping, start with one thing, one thing you can do to um, improve your coping right now or add another skill to your coping kit. And I think it's important to mention too, if you're somebody that's really struggling right now, that it's just, it's not enough to just add something to your coping kit. If you're struggling, now's a great time to consider asking for additional support. Um, 211 is a great resource um, for a bunch of different things. Um, a lot of local providers are offering telehealth therapy sessions and support groups for folks with um, alcohol or drug or other addiction problems. There are a lot of online, often free support groups available right now. And finally, there's always the crisis, uh, the suicide hotline. They are available 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. And so um, I always like to let people know that that is always available should you find yourself in crisis or really struggling with suicidal thoughts. All right, so um, I am happy to take questions at this time. Um, I believe that you can, uh, if anyone has questions, you can just type them into the chat. I'm happy to, to take questions in that format. Make this bigger. Uh, the question is, will we be able to access the PowerPoint later? I know that this webinar will be recorded and posted to the Shark Chats um, um, webpage, so you can certainly access it there. Um, my email address is um, um, at the end of this presentation, so you can certainly email me if, if you need anything else. Okay. So one of the questions is, oh, they're jumping around, hold on. <laughs> uh, can you speak a little bit about helping others, um, lifting others' mood can help, can lifting others' mood help you with your own coping? Um, this is a great question, right? So while you might be taking your inventory of like, how am I doing? How am I coping? Um, you may notice other family members really struggling. So I think um, offering up potential solutions or activities that you can do together um, and really sharing like how it makes you feel, you know, hey, I, I just got this puzzle and I would really love it if you did it with me. It would make me really happy. Oftentimes when we share how something would make us feel, that um, is really reinforcing for the other person to come and do it with you. Even if it feels like, okay, I'm just doing it for them. It might be that catalyst that really gets the ball rolling and gets them up and, and moving and away from the TV, not um, again, just watching those COVID-19 numbers tick up. Um, perhaps asking them, you know, to help you bake something in the kitchen or go for a walk with you. I think um, it can be really, um, you know, small, smaller things, smaller activities um, that could help, again, get the ball rolling. Um, another question is, do you have any specific recommendations for helping school age children? Um, so if we're talking about, which is a great question, if we're talking about coping and adjusting, I would say structure is really key. 
So as best as you can, stick to bedtimes, um, you know, dinner together, those things that um, are really, uh, what do I want to say? Like known, right? They, they are familiar with those things. So in a really uncertain, weird time where, where kids have to adjust to like online school and maybe parents now teaching them, right? There's, there's so much to adjust to. So if we can keep some things constant, that can be really helpful. And um, expectations, right? So if they're used to six hours in school, we may want to back that down a little bit, right? We don't want to expect them to be sitting and, and engaged with their computer that whole time. You may want to think about breaking it up for them and also checking in with them. Hey, I've noticed that you've been spending X amount of time on homework. How is that working for you? Do you want to take a break? I think checking in, um, whether it's school age children or adults, just checking in with another person can help them um, also take stock of like, how am I doing? How is this working for me? So that can be really helpful. Um, and again, one of the things I had also suggested was doing like fun activities that are available right now. So whether it's art projects or going outside in the backyard and exploring, having them, you know, do these activities and, and feel like they have a say in it or they have a fun part. So maybe if you decide, hey, we're going to do a garden, what flowers or what veggies do you want to plant and giving them something that very much feels like their own. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm just looking at these questions. Um, so best recommend, so one of the questions is, what is your best recommendation for people who live alone, specifically young working adults or graduate students living out of their home state who live alone? That's a great question. And absolutely, it's really relevant for a lot of folks right now. I think going back to some of those um, basic principles related to the touch piece, because I'm saying touch, but it's really about connecting to others. So I think making good use of technology, perhaps reaching out to friends ver um, you know, over FaceTime, family members, making use of those Zoom dinner parties, um, ways to connect to your community. Um, so I think it's worth, you know, exploring. And one of the things that I often talk about um, with clients is like, what are your values? What is most important to you? Um, and some people really connect with, you know, uh, service um, or their spirituality. And these are, these are some, you know, ways to explore that. Like, how can I still be connected to my church community right now? Can I engage in outreach? Um, and those are ways to, you know, nurture your connections to other people. But at the same time, I think, again, taking stock of how are you coping when you are home alone? Are you just zoned out watching Netflix and not really engaging? Or are you finding other ways to self-soothe, comfort yourself, engage with visually stimulating um, information? So those are some of the things that I would recommend there. Let's see. So I'm just looking through the questions because there's a whole bunch. Um, this is a great question. Any tips for the stress of trying to focus on work all week and not feel overwhelmed with the sadness of the suffering worldwide? It has been stressful to try and be focused on work and not feel overwhelmed? This is a fantastic question. Um, yes, this is a really overwhelming time and a lot of sad things are happening. Um, and I think one of the most important things to remember is not that we are working from home now because that kind of downplays it of like, oh, we're just, we're just working at home now. You may have been used to working an eight hour day you know, quickly eating lunch at your desk and, and moving on. This is a pandemic. So not, we are not working from home right now. We are trying to work from home during a pandemic. So I think that that's really important to remember. 
because our workload, our stress load, our, th those things are going to be reduced. And um, I think it's important to keep that in mind and be gentle and kind with ourselves because we're not gonna be able to do those eight hours. Many people have um, multiple things on their plate right now, right? Not only are they trying to work, but they're also trying to help their kids cope. They are trying to homeschool for the first time, right? So there is so much on your plate. And I think balancing the expectations of not like, okay, I have to do eight hours and then I have to somehow do everything else that I used to do, laundry, um, cooking, all of that. And now I have to be a teacher for my kid. I don't think that that's realistic. So I think setting ourselves up for realistic expectations during this time, and again, checking in with ourselves, am I trying to do too much? Um, the other piece of that is really allowing space, allowing space to be sad. Um, I think one of the most ineffective strategies that I see is people trying to tell themselves like, nope, I'm not sad, or this isn't going on, or just avoid it completely. And I think we owe it to humanity to, to be sad, to, to acknowledge those feelings and sit with them, not get stuck there, right? I don't think that um, it's helpful to just stay in that, in that dark place, but it's okay. It's okay to acknowledge how you're feeling honor those feelings, and then do something that helps you um, care for yourself. But then also, what do you want to do with that? If you're feeling really sad about um, the shortage of protective equipment for our frontline healthcare workers, and you know how to sew, maybe you're making masks, right, in your one hour of, of free time that, that you have um, protected for that. So it's, it's ways to think about caring for yourself but also others. What do you want to do with those feelings of sadness? Okay. Um, let's see, I'm trying to get a variety of questions. Happy to send out this presentation. Um, let's see. Dr. Thayer, don't forget we have students uh, ready to answer, ask some questions for you. You can call them on at any time. They, 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 are, um, they are welcome to, to jump in. I'm just, I'm just looking through, again, trying to get like a variety of um, of different questions. Um, this is a good one. What can best assist people struggling with substances who are isolated? Um, again, I brought that one up because we're seeing that kind of, um, you know, being, uh, I would say celebrated a little bit. And for, for folks without substance abuse problems, this might be fine, right? A happy hour over Zoom might feel really good and really help you connect. But for others who really struggle with alcohol or substance use, they might be like, what am, what am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do here? So I think, um, you know, continuing to work on your recovery, whatever that looks like for you, wherever you are in that stage, um, whether you're, you know, somebody that uses AA, has a sponsor, now is a great time to be reaching out. Um, as I said, a lot of AA meetings and things have moved online. So you can join a meeting whenever you need. Um, also making use of, of a sponsor and um, trying to think about other things that you can do. Um, a lot of folks that I work with with substance use problems um, use it to numb out or deal with uncomfortable feelings. So I think, you know, using your skills to what is coming up for me right now? Is it because I'm bored? Is it because I'm anxious? What can I do to cope in a healthy way that isn't me turning to substances? Okay. Um, let's see. Somebody asked, 
I keep hearing self-discipline and habits are important right now. What if there is a lack of willpower? How do we jumpstart that? That is a fantastic question. Um, I think that some people have kind of simplified it, right? We've heard people say, if you're not using this time to better yourself and learn a new language and you know lose 50 pounds, then you're wasting this time. I don't agree with that. I think self-care and compassion is the most important thing that we can do right now. Again, you are trying to work. You are trying to keep everything afloat during a pandemic, a worldwide crisis. There is a lot of anxiety and stress. And as I have said, a lot more added to your plate that maybe wasn't there before, coupled with less um, coping skills that you used to have. So I don't think it's a lack of willpower. I think we need to be understanding towards ourselves and thinking about, right, because we, we could, we could get really overwhelmed with, I've got to really overhaul my coping. Start with one thing, one thing that you feel like you want to work on. Um, maybe it's, um, I don't know, I haven't been sleeping well. So then I get up, I'm drinking an excessive amount of coffee. I'm really um, uh, then kind of vegging out in front of the TV and not getting my work done. Then that stresses me out. Then I'm up all night thinking about it. So thinking about like, how can I break that cycle? Maybe I'm going to listen to a guided meditation before bed. I'm going to try to get my bedtime earlier, things like that. So I think it's like just identifying small steps that can get the ball rolling. Um, but also again, being, being compassionate and understanding towards ourselves during a really stressful time, a really stressful time that makes it hard to just do these things. Um, let me see. Can we get a quick student question, please? Absolutely. Hey, Dr. Thayer, my name is Erica. I am a student currently in the um, counseling program, but hoping to obtain a PhD in family therapy soonish. Um, I saw a question here that I think is a very good one. Um, uh, this question says, is there any specific time frame for all of us to assimilate to the changes and the challenges? That's a great question. I don't put a time frame on this, like for assimilating or coping. I think everyone, you know, is an individual. And if you do put a time frame on it, like, okay, after you know, two weeks or after a month, I should be adjusted. I should be acclimated to this new normal. I don't think that that's fair, right? I think it, it kind of discounts our feelings and our struggles. So I, I wouldn't put a time frame on it. I think, um, you know, help, helping yourself um, cope with effective ways. Again, some of the things that we went over today, um, and just do the best you can. I think that's the biggest thing that I'm seeing right now is a lot of people um, beating themselves up for like, well, I should be doing these things or I, yeah, I should be learning a new language or why am I not doing it? And it's, it is what it is, right? This is, this is a stressful time. And I think if we are kind towards ourselves, that is actually the best way to, to get through it effectively. It's, and I'm saying it's okay to have goals or be like, I really want to work on eating healthier or work on my sleep. That's fine. But it's the beating yourself up that tends to not be so great, right? That leads to a lot of guilt, shame, um, and then it, it feeds into ineffective or, or unhealthy ways of coping. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Hi, Dr. Thayer. I'm Janine, and I'm a student in the Clinical PsyD program. And I saw a question, do you have any specific recommendations for expecting mothers or mothers during this time? And are there any plans to conduct any webinars for the prenatal population? That is a great question. Um, I don't know, Dr. Perez may be able to answer that. Um, 
Uh, that is not my, I would say, area of expertise. But what I think about with this population is um, the uncertainty, right? Um, the fear potentially of, you know, needing to go to the hospital to, to give birth or, or get other healthcare needs um, during this time. So I think, once again, coming back to those basic principles of um, acknowledging, acknowledging that those feelings are there, and then caring for yourself as best as you can. Um, I, I think that's, that's the best, that's the best advice I, I have. Um, I, I get it, it might be, um, the, the stress levels much be much, much higher. Um, but it's, it's coming back to those basic principles and applying them for your individual situation. Um, and that's another great group to reach out to online supports for, right? Reaching out to other, um, you know, mothers who are pregnant right now and seeing what they're doing and how they're managing. There's that connection piece um, that you can, you can share in, 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 um, and get support feel connected, but get support with, with some of these concerns. Good, good questions. What else can I answer? In our follow-up uh, email, we will send some resources. We have not specifically identified that piece since we're focusing very much on mental health uh, issues and mental wellness, uh, but we will share some generic resources. Uh, at this point, continue to take as many questions as you want. The students are available when you uh, uh, ask them so you don't have to read the questions. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to happy to take a few more questions. We have a few more minutes. Um, I'm just looking at some questions here. If the students, if you guys have any questions that, that you want to be sure that we cover. Um, I saw one. Excuse me. Um, that says, what's a good way to motivate myself if I'm an essential worker when I'm home over the weekend? Mm, that is a fantastic question. For, so first, I want to say thank you um, for all that you're doing during this time. And this is another way to do that inventory check-in. That that's where I would say start. Um, the, the work that you do is stressful during non-pandemic times. Um, and, and now it's, it's this new heightened level with, again, all of that stress and uncertainty and, and fear. Um, so I think checking in and seeing where you're at with your coping, what you want it to look like. So, um, and, and that discrepancy between like, are there things that you're telling yourself, well, when I'm home, I should be doing laundry, I should be working out, I should be, right? What are those should statements? And are they what you actually want to be doing or what you need? What do you need? Maybe it's more sleep. Maybe it's having a, a conversation with a family member and asking them like, you know, because of my long shifts, could you maybe help with the laundry? Um, so I think it's, you know, relying on our social supports, and really checking in with yourself of like what you need, not what you should be doing um, or what you think you should be doing, right? Um, so it, it, for me, again, really comes back to like being kind and, and understanding towards yourself, knowing that you're doing so much already. And so whatever you decide or whatever you, you know, dis however you decide to dedicate your time, like it's enough, it's enough. other there's one question that says do you have any specific strategies for helping young people and teenagers who bring additional baggage to the situation such as those who have one parent and are afraid of losing them or students who have both parents working in the medical field and are at risk every day mm, that's a really good question um i think it's about the communication um, the worst thing we can do is um, avoid it and not talk about it and pretend like it's not there. It's there and they know it's there. So 
sitting down or, or, you know, maybe, sh you know, shooting hoops outside, playing basketball for a little bit and just checking in with them. But I think creating that space, that safe space where they feel like I can talk about this and it's not to reassure them or say like, Oh, it, everything's going to be okay. No, nothing's going to happen to your dad. Like just saying like, I get it. Like this is, this is really scary right now. And a lot of people are scared and just reaching out. Um, I think that's one of the best things we can do and it's okay to not have the answers. It's okay. Um, because no, we, we don't. Right. And, um, I think one of the things that parents can really do, um, and help with here is modeling, modeling that it's okay to, to not know, right? Life is full of uncertainty as much as, as humans, we like to like know what's going to happen and, and have that we don't, right? There's a lot of uncertainty, um, in life. And so if you can model that, um, for your kids and show like, we can get through this together, right? We're supporting each other. And, um, and it's okay not, to not know. It's okay to not have the answers. I think that's one of the, the most powerful things that, that parents can do right now. Um, I had another question here. Um, any guidance for someone who feels very anxious with uh, any breathing issues that they may have COVID-19, especially now in allergy season? This is a great question. So um, uh, I'm not a medical provider, right? I'm a psychologist, but I think if what, what I want to address here is if you <clears throat> feel that tickle in your throat or, you know, some stuffiness, if your anxiety kind of takes that and runs with it, if it's like, oh gosh, this is it, it's, it's COVID-19 and I'm going to, right? If it just takes it and run with it, using some of these strategies to help slow it down and decrease that sympathetic nervous system response of like, I've got to do this and this, 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 right, slow it down. So thinking about what strategies work well for you, maybe it is taking a hot shower, maybe it is doing some, you know, gentle stretching or yoga. I mean, there are, again, those are just two suggestions, but I think helping yourself calm down and think it through, like, um, you know, how have I dealt with my allergies in the past? If this is COVID-19, what would I do? How would I cope with that? And allowing yourself to kind of, again, um, decrease that anxiety so that you can be most effective. Because I think the worst thing you can do is like take that anxiety, run with it, and then it spins out of control. Dr. Thayer, I see a question here that I think um, a lot of people are kind of having to navigate either for themselves or um, someone that they know, but it says, how do you cope with the loss of someone due to this pandemic and are unable to visit or have services? It's a really, really important and salient question. Um, so I think first, th there's two parts here, right? It's like how we deal with it individually um, and then how we are able to really like honor their memory, right? We're not able to visit or have services right now, which is really hard for a lot of people, um, from different religious faiths or, or have backgrounds where there is a traditional way of honoring, honoring our dead, right? So first, um, allowing yourself to be sad, allowing that grief process to happen, Again, the worst thing we can do is try to avoid it or pretend like it's not there or try to numb those feelings out. Um, we have to think about, although it's, it's a devastating loss and you know, it's, it's, it's unthinkable, we, 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 who would see this coming, right? Um, I think it's figuring out a way to honor the person's memory. And so again, thinking about what can I do? what can i do to honor their memory right now maybe it's um volunteering your time or again doing some of that service outreach something like that what was important to the person who were they and how can we 
honor that and like keep that going, right? What was really central to to them? Did they love working with kids? Like what what was it, right? What was it about them? And um and then perhaps making plans for a service or or something like that for when things do sort of return back to normal and those things are available. So I don't think it's a matter of, well, if we don't do it right now, we're never going to do it. I think that there can be some creativity really applied to this situation of like, how can we do this in a unique way now with, with these limitations? And is there something else that we would like to do once, once more options are, are available? Um, yeah, but, but the, the grieving process needs its space. And I think it's, it's part of honoring this connection that, that you had with this person. Um, it is 11 o'clock, so I, I wanna be mindful of the, the time. Is there, sh should, should we wrap up, Dr. Perez? Uh, yes, uh, I would go ahead and, and stop that. And then we, I have uh, a couple questions for you. Thank you very much, students, for joining us. Any uh, parting words before I uh, give a farewell? I just want to thank everyone for attending. And um, I'm going to actually bump this slide so you can see um, my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and, and also check out the other Shark Chat webinars in this series. Um, the link is there so you can see what's coming up and, and register. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Uh, I will send everyone a thank you email that everyone that's registered, we encourage you to share this presentation to your friends. The URL is very simple. It's nova.edu forward slash shark chats. Sharks are a mascot. That's why we chose that. Um, I will also make, uh, provide a link for NSU Cares. Uh, helping our students that are distressed at this moment. This is a very important area. I know that uh, there's many organizations that are looking for um, opportunities to help their, their uh, organizations. Uh, these gifts go directly to our students. Uh, so I encourage you to consider that, especially our alumni. Uh, a special shout out to uh, the first responders, the nurses, the doctors, the law enforcement individuals, the people working uh, in these markets. Um, you are incredible heroes. Um, NSU's uh, College Psychology, we offer bachelor's, master's, and doctoral programs. We also offer clinics that service the public. Uh, visit us at our website, psychology.nova.edu. That's psychology at nova.edu. Uh, we are so happy to have you here today, Dr. Thayer. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, you, you can see the, the chats, people applauding your efforts. Um, thank you very much for, for giving time and joining us. And a special thanks to our students that joined us. Um, uh, I will run the poll just uh, as uh, I stop the recording.